Hello, and welcome to Six Figure Authors, not an official podcast episode, but we are doing a question and answer session here live on YouTube. And I am Lindsay Baroker, science fiction and fantasy author, just in case anybody wanders in new and doesn't know us. I've been self-publishing mostly for uh, the last 10 years, full time since 2012. And I guess I've got, gosh, a lot of books I've written. I write quite a lot. I'm the prolific one in the group. I've got about maybe 80 novels between my name and a pen name. And um, yeah, we're going to, I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves and then I'll ask a question and we'll chat, answer it for a few minutes. And then we're going to open it up and just answer your questions. Anybody who's live right now and in the chat, we appreciate you coming. Uh, Joe, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, my name is Joseph Lalo. I've been publishing since, well, I've been writing since forever, but I've been publishing since 2010. I got, again, science fiction and fantasy writer. I've got three main series with uh, at least six books in them. And then I've got a couple other series. I don't know, probably around 30, 40 books at this point. I have, I do not have a tally ready to go. And uh, I'm mostly known for the Book of Deacon series, but I also wrote uh, Free Wrench and Big Sigma. And I've been hosting, uh, co-hosting this podcast and its predecessor, the uh, Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, since about 2014. I guess awesome. it's my turn now. Yeah, Andrea, I was going to introduce you, but you can just start <laughs> okay. talking if you like. <laughs> I'm so used to that transition, you know. Um, okay, so I'm Andrea Pearson, and I am, I'm an author. Like, what have I been doing? I don't know. Um, I've been publishing since again 2011, and a uh, former um, president of the, uh, what was that group called? Indie Author Hub Group. Um, I am a marketing instructor for Dean Wesley Smith's uh, Business Masterclass for Authors. And I've got um, over 75 titles, which includes probably 40 or 50 novels and a bunch of um, novellas and books for kids and short stories and just whatever I feel like doing. So that's pretty much me. I believe I answered the question correctly, right? <laughs> yes, that's um, five points for you. Congratulations. <laughs> um, yes. And we are all mostly self-published, although I think we've all at this point sold uh, like audio stuff and some foreign rights and things like that. And if, if you're trying to get to six figures, I'm not going to say it's easy. There's no road that's easy, but it's a, uh, you know, because you make like 70% on the sale of like eBooks, especially it, it's a, it's a lot more feasible. You have to be, become a really big seller or get like a huge advance and, <laughs> and hope that they market the heck out of you with traditional publishing. Um, but there are lots of authors too that do kind of a hybrid approach. Do They start out traditional and then self-publish some stuff on the side. Totally a legitimate way to get there. And of course, some people hit it really big and they never do anything else but work with their publisher and that's fine too. All right, so before we start answering your questions, I thought it would be cool to ask each other what for you guys, as you know, we've all been in this for more than 10 years now, what has kind of been some of the hard, harder things that you've had to deal with as a full-time author and slash, I know Andrea, you do some coaching and stuff too. I think Joe and I are kind of oddballs in that we just do the fiction, but you never know. <laughs> Maybe if the fiction ever tanks, there's always the option, right? Of doing some other stuff. A lot of people do really well with nonfiction and teaching and stuff too. But yeah, what, what has been hard for you over, you know, doing this for a career, whoever wants to go first? <laughs> I'll go first. Um, I think that the hardest part, and it's one that like, uh, I can, I literally just over the course of the, of our little hiatus, I was trying to brush up on is determining how much of my success or failure is based upon my direct actions versus just happenstance. Like, uh, I had a pretty good system that got me to six figures, I thought, but it turns out that system was actually a sequence of fairly good luck, and I capitalized on it well, but I didn't have as direct control over my success as I'd hoped, uh, so I didn't, like, uh, we talk a ton on this show about how advertising is more or less essential. You can you can have a career if you do anything well enough without any of the the key components, but uh, I was never particularly good at advertising. I didn't rely, rely upon advertising. And uh, and so as my career developed and I saw that, you know, uh, organic discovery was going down and down, adapting to basically an entirely new uh, business model uh, was the hardest part. And I basically had to change my business model like four different times. Uh, things move fast in this industry. And that's definitely what I had the hardest time with is sort of keeping pace and realizing what I needed to change and how I needed to change it and also quantifying how well any given change was working. Uh, and as for me, um, the hardest 
thing, and this won't be a huge surprise to our listeners. The hardest thing for me has been juggling um, my writing career with my family, making sure that I'm giving enough time to both um, to make it worth it. And, and also um, what's the word rewarding Um, and not just that, but I'm a project person. So I like to focus on one thing until it's done. And that worked really great before I had kids, but now that I have kids, it's, it's too difficult to find the time to do that. And so I'm having to kind of try to make my personality adapt and adjust to be able to do a little bit here and there. And so that's been the thing that's been the most challenging for me. I mean, I've still been fairly prolific over the years and, and had a lot of success, but it's still, it's, it's a lot dif- more, it's a lot difficulter now. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, I would say that now my goal is to, to write, continue writing as I can, and then just not so worry so much about royalties and things like that until I have enough, uh, enough books in the current series out. And, and then I can start marketing it and make it more, uh, make it actually earn money for me. And yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Yeah. I, when we got started, actually, I think I was just the beginning of 2011, late 2010. I was like looking for ways to advertise my books. I would be happy to pay, take my money if it would sell books. And there were very few options back then. So, you know, a lot of us learned to try the free book one in series. And um, I still do that, it was, especially with my older series. But I also do Amazon ads and Facebook ads, especially Amazon is what I'm kind of let always have. Like I always have that running now. And um, Facebook ads, I, I try to get better at them every time that I launch a new series. But I would say something that's been hard for me and that they don't talk about in uh, any of the writing classes or workshops or anything like that, or really anywhere until you're actually out in the world making money, is just learning the business side of it. You know, when you're a salaried employee, somebody's taking money out to pay your taxes for you or, you know, or uh, you're getting like a 401k match. So even your retirement might be, you know, at least somewhat handled and you don't realize until you start until you're like full time. And this is for anybody self-employed that you actually have to make more than you did before uh, when you were working for someone else because you have no benefits. You have to pay for your, at least here in the US, you have to pay for your own health insurance and you still have to start socking aside money for investing in all those things. And, and yeah, I also, you know, I feel like almost no authors are natural marketers. We're kind of like, uh, Andrea is not an introvert, as she'll tell you. She actually likes people, peopling. Uh, and then, the, but a lot of us are just really, we cringe inside of the idea of somebody's like, what's your elevator pitch for your book? And you're like, oh my gosh, if I was stuck in an elevator with someone and they talk to me, I'd be horrified. I don't know what I would say about anything. So thankful for the internet. Uh, just, I love that in this last 10 years, it's changed a little bit. So you actually don't have to do like go to conventions and do book signings unless you want to. And, and some people do enjoy that kind of thing. Um, do you guys have any more thoughts on that? I see we have some questions now, so we can jump to that unless you want to blather more. Nobody wants to blather more about my question. Okay, I think the first one is from MJ. I would like to know what you consider to be your one truism since you started. What one thing worked for you in the beginning and still works? Um, I'll start again. We'll just do that sequence. Um, so uh, truism, I mean... I'm going to have to break this up a little bit. Um, the one like marketing thing that I find has remained consistently valuable for me is the newsletter. I think that the newsletter is uh, focusing on having a decent sized newsletter. Uh, one that's, you know, they actually open your newsletter is probably the me- the, be- the most solid way to have, uh, uh, you know, a reliable pool of people who are going to buy your stuff in terms of craft and stuff like that. I think that writing a, a series with engaging characters is the one way to sort of the best thing you can do as a writer is get good at writing characters that people connect with and ideally in storylines that span multiple books it gets people really into, interested in your stuff and they'll follow you as an author if you really develop your voice in that way. And the first thing that came to mind for me was and it wasn't newsletters. <laughs> even though that's what I do. Uh, It was actually giving away stuff for free. And what I've given away over the years has changed and it's increased and gotten, you know, a little uh, creative and not always just books and things like that, but like the download bonuses and uh, my reader magnet, things like that. And, and uh, for perma-free books and box sets, those are the things that still work for me. Um, Everybody's like, but not as much. I'm like, oh yeah, of course, nothing works just as well as it did when it first came out, but it still worked me. 
You took mine. Everybody knows by now. I love free. And that's actually something I did very early on. Uh, you know, in the beginning, I only had two novels and they weren't even in a series. They were unrelated uh, other than being set in the same world. They had no similar characters, no crossover, which because when you're going, because I thought like many people back then, I would have to do traditional publishing. And they say, they were like, well, don't write a series until you know if the first one's going to get a deal. So I started writing book two, totally unrelated. But as an indie author or when you're self-publishing, or this is true, honestly, once you have a deal or once you're going to get a book out there, a series is a great thing because it, assuming you hook them in the first book and they like the characters, the second book is a lot easier to sell them a continuation of the series than to sell some whole new project, uh, even if they liked the first one. Uh, so I didn't really have like anything I could make free book-wise in the beginning, but I figured out you know, I had this short story that was about the same characters that were in what was going to become a series, uh, my first Emperor's Edge book. And it's because uh, I had this short story, I think I had submitted it to like Marion Zimmer Bradley's sort of sorcery magazine or something like that. I don't even know if it still exists, but uh, got rejected. Uh, and I was just like, I loved it. It was like, I thought it was, I mean, it was like a fun story, it had banter. It was like a good introduction to the characters. And so uh, it was kind of hard to figure out how to go get stuff free, especially in Amazon at the time. I don't know there was a trick uh, with that. Basically, if you have it free and all the other stores, Amazon will eventually price match, hopefully. Um, but at the time, uh, I, I did know I could make it free on Smashwords, which was the distributor I started using uh, when I first started. Uh, because in the beginning, you couldn't even, I think Amazon was the only place you could actually upload directly. In the beginning, you had to go through distributor to get to Barnes Noble, Kobo, uh, Google Play, I don't think was even if it was in existence, I don't think they had ebooks. Um, but yeah, I made that short story free, and I actually wisely got a really cool cover. I, we, I had to get off Deviant Art. I had to find the artist that I liked and uh, paid him $200 for a story I was going to give away for free. And at the time, that was really huge money for me. That was uh, I also spent $200 for that first book. Uh, so it was kind of a gamble, but I thought if enough people read the short story and why wouldn't they try it if it's free. Uh, I also put an excerpt of the first Emperor's Edge book in the back, just a couple pages. It was, I think it was from like chapter 12 or something like the monster was coming. It was tens uh, to try to lure them into buying the book afterwards. But I think it was actually the free short story that did it. It was just an introduction to the characters. And I said, hey, if you want to know how these characters first came to meet, check out the first book. And I was selling my two novels at $2.99 then. And that's the first thing I did that actually sold books. So let's be honest, I put my books out there and nothing happened uh, originally. So it wasn't really into, like maybe I sold like three copies by posting on message boards and begging strangers. <laughs> but I mean, I, I think a lot of authors have this where even friends and family my parents are like fantasy sci-fi what what i would why would i read that although since my mom has read some of my stuff but she's more of a mystery thriller kind of person uh so that was the first thing that got strangers to pick up my books and actually pay for them and since then i've been a big proponent i'm always willing to do free not just for, you know i do like free book ones if it's an eight book series and it's a complete i'll just you know, make the, the free book one and make it uh, available everywhere. I also try to do lots of bonuses for people who subscribe to my newsletter. And often we've talked about this on our podcast a lot. So you get anybody in the chat that's, you know, been around knows we like to use the lure them onto the newsletter with like the free, the second epilogue or the prequel novella or something like that, that after they've read the book, they're like, oh, I totally want to know about that one character. And so they'll sign up for the newsletter that way. And that is something I've just continued to do. I just try to, almost every series I, I write, you know, I try to do some kind of novella or, or bonus stories and I'll do character interviews and things like that on my website too. So I'm just, I think having the mindset of um, some of the stuff you do should just be out there. It's like the cheapest, even though it takes time, it becomes the, the least expensive marketing you'll do. Uh, it's not always easy to, you still have to get people to your, download your free thing but it, i don't know about you guys but i find it a lot easier to plug it on twitter and facebook like hey check out this thing it's free uh so that's been for me did you guys already answer you told totally already answered so we should move on to the next question and i should talk less all right vin wants to know and he i think he wants joe and andrea to talk a lot i'm sensing it I'd love to know what's changed for everyone's author business in 2021 is it about the same or have you made any big shifts um, so my author business hasn't changed markedly. Um, I, the, the shifts that I have made are, uh, mostly, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I have been getting a little bit deeper into, uh, just sort of ongoing advertising. I typically didn't, I had maybe 
three ads running at any given time, and they were like ancient ads pointing to my uh, my box sets. And they'd all sort of tapered off and haven't been doing anything. So I, I took a couple of weeks and I uh, I did a very deep dive into my the history of how my books were going. I'd like, you know, read through and all that. I wrote a gigantic sales processor to uh, to go through all of my, my sales and look at my read through from the beginning and breaking it up by months and stuff. So that I could see how much I can afford to spend on advertising. And so 2021 has been sort of my reintroduction into hardcore uh, advertising. And I also, uh, 2021 is my second attempt at doing a series that uh, launches exclusive to Amazon. I've done this once before, and that series is in fact still uh, exclusively on Amazon because my plan was to take it wide once it was finished, and I never finished it because it didn't do very well at all. Uh, so this new one, taking a second stab at it, the second book just released a couple of days ago, um, and I'm already 30, 40,000 words into, into book three. So those are going to be, I'm going to be trying a bunch of new uh, uh, Amazon KU stuff with those. So I'm going to, a big shift for this year is going to be KU stuff. And uh, yeah, that's about it. And then for me, um, yeah, um, there's been, I mean, a big mental shift for me. Just, you know, the the recognition that I'm kind of in a different season of life right now than I was, you know, five, 10 years ago where I could write as much as I wanted and I could focus as much time as I needed on marketing. And it was, you know, when I did things, things happen, like, you know, I would market and it would be successful. Um, so it's been a big mental shift for me to just recognizing that I, that like this shift in my brain from writing for money and success to writing, because it really does make me happy. And, um, I'm not, we're not paying the bills with my books. Uh, my books pay for themselves and I'm still, you know, definitely in the green, solidly in the green every month, but it's not, it's not as, not as lucrative, lucrative. I feel, I feel dirty using words like these, <laughs> but it's not as lucrative as it was in the past and that's okay. And, and that's just this, my time right now. And that's what I've been focusing on, especially since our move in June and everything. So for the time being, I am focusing on keeping things stress-free writing when I, not just want to, but when I have the time and I, that there's that bug that's always like, right, 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 right. And I'm, I'm kind of have to calm that down a little bit because I don't always have the time that I need. Um, like I said, I'll get back to it again, but right now it's, I'm just focusing on breathing and not stressing, um, writing and releasing without a goal to make a splash is another mental, um, mental shift that I've had to make. So I, in the past, I would, write and release fairly rapidly. Like I did, you know, between four and six novels a year, which is, I think is fast. It's not as fast as Lindsay, <laughs> Miss Lindsay, who's like 30 books a month. Um, but she's, she's going to disagree with me. That's not 30 books a month, Andrea. <laughs> anyway, I was um, going to say, I don't have three kids. I just have dogs <laughs> and they're demanding slightly, but it's not quite the same. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I mean, four to six books a year, I, I think that's fairly, that's pretty prolific. Um, and, and I, I, during that time, I was like, oh, I can't believe how slow I am. But now I look back and I'm like, I'm grateful for how fast I was because I have a lot of books that I can market and promote when I'm not spending time writing. Like I actually have stuff to work with and like for a new author, you know, I mean, it's super stressful to, you're like, I want to be getting my books downloaded, but you really do need to focus on building up your catalog. Like if you don't have anything to market, I mean, you can't market the same book over and over and over. You have to actually divide things up and spend time on other things. And because the, the, the market, the genre, the readers, they get bored of that same thing. And so anyway, so I'm writing and releasing right now with the goal just to write and release just to get books published. Um, and that's, that's, it's been rewarding. I haven't told any of my readers that, you know, my, in the new genre, I haven't told any of my readers that I've got book two up. <laughs> it's been published since the beginning of June. I still haven't emailed my list to say, Hey guys, I have a book published. Um, but it's, and that's okay. It's honestly, it is totally okay because I've, I've done this for over 10 years. I know how to make my career start and stop. And I know I will be able to pick up loose ends once I uh, hit the ground running again. Um, and then the other shift I've made is I've, I've shifted away from writing fantasy entirely, which is really ironic because I'm like my midnight chronicles, it's starting to gain traction and momentum. And I'm like, really guys. <laughs> so, um, 
the audio book is up on YouTube and I've, I've uh, had a lot of people reach out to me and say, oh, you've got to finish the series. You got to finish the series. I'm going to finish the series, but right now I'm, I'm writing romance as you guys know. And I, it's been so much fun and so rewarding. And I'm like, I just need to write for me right now. And I don't care about readers. I mean, I do, but I tell myself, I don't care about them. <laughs> so that's, that's my answer. Well, it is kind of nice to have low expectations. We've actually talked about this before. If you really, cause I guys, when I wrote my first, uh, goblin brothers book it's not even out there it's not a, a novel and i submitted to agents submitted it to agents i was like this is so brilliant obviously it's gonna be huge and i'm gonna get rich and if, why would you not like a story about two goblin brothers it was like middle grade you know which i also knew nothing about really <laughs> i was just like well they're the characters are young so it'll probably appeal to kids um, but yeah, it's better to have the expectation of, well, you know, if I just try to gradually over time get more readers, that that would be a success because it kind of snowballs to, you know, if you continue to market your books as you get them out and hopefully each new release, you get a couple more in there. It, gradually over time, assuming you kind of have the craft side good, you know, good enough that you're making uh, enjoyable stories for people and they're satisfied and they want more, you will pick up more readers over time. And it gets a little easier with subsequent releases because you already have readers that are going to go out and buy the, the next series. Um, so what's changed for me in 2021? Uh, not a whole lot. I'm still finding um, I, I'm still finding Amazon ads a fortune, but still effective, I would say, as long as you're writing a series uh, and you don't, it's, it's tough if you just have one book right now in this era, because ebooks, even if you're charging more like $7.99 than $3.99 or $4.99, it's still tough because you might take eight or 10 clicks in order to get a buyer and a click might cost you 30, 40 cents or more. <laughs> and if you're in like a super competitive genre where, where the authors are bidding up the ads or you get people that have a 10 book series so they can afford to pay a dollar a click or something like that. And if you're trying to make that work on a book that is only $4.99 that you're getting three 70 or whatever from it, it's going to be really tough um, the one thing that's probably changed for me in this last year is for me this is the first year i'm breaking six figures just from audiobook sales and that is i mean i have a lot of books so it's not that impressive but it's impressive to me because it's taken a long time to get there i've always sold way more ebooks and then eh, a few little paperbacks here and there i don't really try to do the paperbacks and then some audiobooks but it was never really that big of a number and that's been two things that have really kicked that off one uh putting the first in series actually I put more than that on youtube and, and then putting links youtube doesn't care if you link to like all the google play and you know here it's at find away voices and audible and all these places so that really helped me get my death before dragon series selling quite a bit i've had some really good paydays from acx even though that particular series is not even exclusive so it's only getting the 25 percent at acx and then i've also got that one find a way you know at find away voices and through them like 30 places and you know i've been getting some sales on kobo and google play and into the libraries so that's really helped and even though I will say, you guys may have heard, I was ranting on Twitter last week, YouTube demonetized my channel after approving me last winter. They, uh, I haven't really gotten a reply back that made sense, but another author tweeted me and said he kind of went down the rabbit hole and found out they only kind of want original content, like exclusive, basically. Obviously my audiobooks are original. Uh, and so that's what he heard. And I don't know how much it's worth fighting for, but I'm probably going to take everything off, but I am going to leave the book ones up there because I did definitely see a huge, you know, I could kind of see as I was posting book one, two, and three, people didn't want to wait and they'd go get book four or five and so on, uh, you know, from ACX and the other channels. So that was one thing that really helped increase the audiobook income. And the other one is not in my hands. It's uh, my publisher, Podium Audio. They, um, uh, ACX has started, uh, Audible has started their subscription plus program, where if you're a subscriber now you get the credit that, you know, or three credits, whatever your membership plan is, but you also get access to a bunch of, they've got like thousands of free titles in the US and they just added that in the UK. So I'm hoping my book is also in the UK too, but uh, Podium got my three book omnibus for my Dragonblood series into that program. 
and it was a it's been a huge bump i mean i'm it, i'm no it won't last but i was like the last payday i was just like whoa what am i gonna buy with all this money besides paying my taxes on it and all that but uh so that was pretty cool and i i would love it if they open that up to some you know some maybe indie authors i don't know if they'll let everybody in right away but maybe they'll see some people that are you know and this is i think it's only my that one book and then some of the shorter things they put in there but I would obviously love as somebody who also publishes audiobooks that I, you know, pay for and do myself. I would love it if I could like put my first Death Before Dragon books into that program because it's just been, it's funny because that's an older series. I think I finished it four or five years ago, but all of a sudden I'm getting a new, bunch of new fans that way. And they're like, are you going to write new more books in this series? And they're like, uh, maybe someday I'm totally working on these other two series right now. Maybe you could check those out. But so that's, the, kind of been the big thing for me in 20 late 2020 and 2021 is just I feel like I've been promised how great audiobooks are increasing you know sales are increasing for years and years and this was the first year I was like oh okay this is not bad not shabby at all so crossing my fingers that that will you know more fa the fans will find my other series through the Dragon Blood series. Okay, Accent on Acupuncture and Health Wellness Center. Look at that, getting that plug into our little chat. Oh, I love it. Um, Lindsay, I've been using the book and course Save the Cat. As a plotter yourself, what is your method or how do you plot? And I think you guys also outline, right? So you, you want to answer first while I drink? Sure. Um, I can say that... Uh... Well, the way I do it is uh, I just start at the you know I, I point A and point Z or whatever. I'll start like here's where my book w will start and here's where my book will end. And if I'm writing in a series, obviously my second book is starting roughly where the first one ended, so that flows. Uh, and then I'll choose some major events I want and put those intermediate points, and then I'll just start connecting all of those. And if it's a really complicated one, like I'm doing another, my, my new series is Epic Fantasy, so I'm going, almost every book I've ever written has got multiple simultaneous threads going on. I will split those threads up basically into their own outlines, or at least into their own like sections of outline, so that I know that something interesting is happening along each set of characters. And then, yeah, just, just fill it in with greater and greater detail until I feel as though uh, it's a complete story with enough interesting stuff in it. And then I'll, I might slide stuff around or add or remove if I feel like the pace is bad in my uh, in my outline. But it's a it's a pretty simple process for me. Um, so when I'm doing fantasy, um, it's um, I usually know where I'm going. So like that A through J, A through J, A through Z. <laughs> so I know where I'm going and I know some of the things I need to do to get there. And what I'll generally do is like. I just, I brainstorm, I sit down and brainstorm, like how long do I want the book to be? So if I'm going for 50,000 words and I like to use bullet points, I'll do like one bullet point per scene. And I'll make, I need to make sure that I get between 25 and 30 bullet points. And that includes pivotal conversations and, you know, battles and fights and, and, and I'm banging my desk. And so my, my camera is like wobbling. Sorry guys. So I'm going to hold still really well now. <laughs> um, so yeah. So then I, I just fill in with the bullet points and I make sure that every book has, I generally will outline the series. Um, I got to move. I generally outline the series as, uh, as part of outlining a book, because if I don't know where I'm going overall with the whole series, then I generally don't know what sorts of things I need to foreshadow in the first few books. And so I don't always know everything. And that's one of the fun things about being an author. Like I hit book three and then I'm like, crap, I wrote myself into a corner in book one, but oh, wait, that makes it a lot more fun to get out of because then I have to come up with some tricky, sneaky, unexpected way to get them out of that problem. And so that's not always an issue, not knowing everything ahead of time. Um, when I'm doing romance, um, I use romancing the beat. Uh, I don't know if you guys probably not, I'm sure some of our listeners have, um, Gwen Hayes, I believe is who wrote it, but it's, it's great. Romance is a lot more formulaic than fantasy is. And honestly, my first romance in my most recent series, um, <laughs> one of my reviews says caution readers, unexpected twists. <laughs> and I was like, dangerous romance guys. So I was like, okay, dang it. I was a little too unpredictable. So uh, romance is formulaic, but I've found that I love following that formula. Um, it kind of hits a different part of my brain than fantasy does, but I do have that tendency to throw in things that people don't expect and not every romance reader is going to like that. So anyway, so yeah, that's, that's basically what I do when I'm, um, plotting. 
I can't tell you how many times I've started writing what I thought was going to be a romance because I like I have a romantic heart. I like those stories when they, they get together and then there's like a dead body at the end of chapter one or like a sacrificed chicken or there's a deer head in the new one I'm working for. Poor animals getting sacrificed left and right, but I sacrifice humans too, so it's all fair. And you just realize like, oh, okay, I'm probably never going to be a, really a romance author it's always gonna be like fantasy or sci-fi first with romantic elements which is fine as long as you market it correctly but yeah romance you got to be born and bred that I think it has to be like in your bones um, so my outlining method I'm very chronological it's just how I think I have this linear I, I'm not at all a person that makes like note cards and just <laughs> has like a spaghetti thing going on I just sit down and like what happens and then what happens next and what happens because of that and at this point I've kind of internalized story structure obviously you want to be kind of having this rising tension and then you're going to have little bits in between like you know going up the mountain where the breather for the reader and the, the characters can have their emotional <laughs> moments and then the tension starts going up and up and then you have the climax the battle you know if it's fantasy and sci-fi at the end and maybe a denouement if I can pronounce these fancy words so um, if you're not really if you haven't done a lot of novels yet you might want to have some kind of structure I think there was somebody called man I, I don't remember her name but I remember her book I think it was outlining or plotting around the clock and she had it we had her on the show she had to divide it up in, in the clock and like these are the things that should happen between you know noon and three and, the, and like there were four quarters to make sure you were kind of getting all the points in your story wasn't meandering along without any sense of rising tension all right next question from elise even if youtube demonetizes an audiobook do you think having the free audio free audio available helps drive awareness and eventual purchases Yes, yes, I do. And I will, I'm going to be taking down all the extra audiobooks and just probably leave up book one in each series, but I'm going to be planning to continue to put book one and new series up with all the links to the stores and a lot of my stuff because I'm not going exclusive anymore with Audible ACX is available in the library. So I feel like, you know, you're probably out of luck if you're not in the US. I did get a whole lot of like international people who are just otherwise would not really have good access to to the audiobooks but so I don't know I may keep up more but I don't know if I'm going to have a nine book series up there if I'm not getting paid for it especially since YouTube can show ads on it it's like in their terms of service they can still show ads on it even if you're not in the partner program and you're not making any money I'm like ah okay I don't know how I feel about that I'd rather have it just free in the library um, but you guys both did uh, an audiobook or more on YouTube what has your experience been um, so I have not monetized yet uh, because I don't have enough subscribers. I have put literally zero effort into trying to build my uh, my subscribers. I just literally took the two reasonably complete audiobooks that I had available. Reasonably complete meaning they weren't just like the middle of a series. Uh, and just put them up and whatever has happened, happened. And so far, even though they're not series starters, uh, one of them is sort of a standalone and the other one is, oh, it was a, it was a reader magnet. It was a, uh, It's a prequel that doesn't lead directly into the series, I have seen a little bit of a bump in the audiobook sales uh, of the related series, especially since I uh, don't have one up for my third my third uh, uh, series. I don't have any free wrench audio up yet. So I have like a pretty good, you know, apples to apples comparison of with or without an audiobook on, on uh, YouTube. And it's not gigantic. Like you're talking about making six figures on audiobooks. Like I don't know if I've broken four figures on audiobooks. Uh, but uh, it's it's noticeable in that it's you know, a, a, probably a double digit, like probably a 10, 15% increase in sales of the associated audiobooks. So I think it's definitely worth having up there, even if you're not making money directly off of YouTube. Especially, I think I'd be doing even better if I had a, a book one of each of my series that are free as you know, ebooks, if I had them available on YouTube just to directly lead into the series, but all of those are traditionally published in audio, so I don't have access to them uh, to put up on my own. And uh, Lindsay, what was your, your additional question? Just uh, if you, you said you had an audiobook now, I know you're newer to the audiobooks. Did you have one on YouTube that you put up there? Yeah, I've got two on YouTube right now. Um, I hit a thousand subscribers last week and YouTube was like, you can't monetize your channel <laughs> because of a video I put up 11 years ago, wherein my brother and his roommate lip sync to West side stories 
um, tonight, tonight. Uh, so I deleted that video. I'm not allowed to reapply for another month. So I'm kind of, I was a little annoyed about that. I was like, dang it, 11 years ago, I would have deleted a long time ago if I'd known it would cause problems in the future. But anyway, so um, yeah. Well, they may, they may have a new policy. It sounds like they're refusing a lot of audiobooks. So, which That's is too bad because to I thought I saw them as another subscription service, basically, because we were either getting paid via the ad views or from premium YouTube premium subscribers. Uh, so that's unfortunate, really, because there's a lot of stupid junk up there that they have no problem putting ads on. But I guess I won't talk badly or, or our video would disappear here. Um, but yeah, I think it's I think it's worth doing because it is there aren't a lot of audiobooks on YouTube right now. So it's kind of a discovery tool. That's what I found. That's why I got the big boost. It wasn't I was I mean, I think I announced it to like Facebook and maybe my newsletter. But, you know, they got like 200 views out of that. But then people were looking up urban fantasy audiobook and mine came up for quite a while uh you know things do kind of get buried after a while if you're not continuously putting new stuff on there but you might still get some hits uh you know especially if you check in your genre make sure if you do it you put in you know thriller or put your keywords into the title and in the description to, to help their search <laughs> Gabe asks, how do you go from book publishing to movie production? What are the steps? Somebody has to see your book and want to produce it. Oh, man, uh, there's a whole book. I think Chris Catherine Rush, doesn't she talk about it in uh, her book on dealing with licensing and agents? Or Do you know, Andrea, does she have one specifically on movies? Um, I don't know if she has one. She, she talks about it. She has tons of blog posts on it. And um, so if you just Google Christine Catherine Rush and Hollywood, you'll get a lot of hits and or go to the business master class because they focus on that every single year because it's a lot of authors make they they kind of screw themselves over when they're looking into hollywood so because hollywood screws them over <laughs> you have to like Pretty really much. really look at the contract and a lot of times there's stories of like you know people they'll just buy the options on things and authors are happy like my movie's gonna get made and all they're doing is like they have this other movie they want to make and uh i was just talking to somebody about this and you know and then the they just buy the options on everything similar so that they won't get made. You know, a lot of people just sell the options and it just, and nothing ever happens and nothing ever comes of it. So, hey, it, it might happen, you know, but make sure you get somebody, if you don't have an agent, a IP attorney or somebody to look over the contract or read Chris Catherine Rush, who's got like a 200 page book on it. So uh, I will cross that bridge if it ever comes to me. But I feel like when you write sci-fi and fantasy, it's like even harder because you have this stuff that would require huge expensive sets. And, you know, you got it's like you kind of have to know somebody in the industry if you want like the expanse to be made. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, they were buddies with um, George R. R. Martin. Go figure. Um, but nah, let's see. Next question. Nikolai, do you think the future of publishing is in small presses where two to five authors team up into one house to share efforts and audiences? Um, I first. <laughs> I'll go. Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, I think the future of publishing. Well, first off, uh, it's going. It's not going to be whatever we think it's going to be. There's, there's seismic changes in uh, in publishing regularly. But I think that the future publishing is going to be a steadily larger proportion of books are going to be produced not at the biggest uh, publishers. Like I don't even know. I would. It's not the. Is it still? Is it still the big five? I don't know how many there are. They tend to be contracting these days. But I think that the same. Like they will still be producing a huge number of books. But I think a larger proportion is going to be just trickling out to smaller publishers. I don't know that the future is necessarily going to be people banding together into small presses. I think that um, that's definitely going to be useful, uh, but I think it's just going to be one of a spectrum of different ways you're going to you're going to see people publishing. I think self-publishing is going to continue to be an enormous part of it. Maybe maybe not as big as things go on. Like there was a gold rush period when everybody wanted to get into it, and I think we've probably reached not steady state, but not explosive growth anymore. So uh, I think we're just going to sort of see what we've been having, but growing overall, just more authors because the bar to entry is getting lower and lower. And probably the big, uh, the biggest publishers are probably going to still be making the biggest books. And like the lion's share of individual contracts are probably still going to go to them. But we'll probably see them bleeding out some talent into smaller places just because, you know, the amount of money that they're making is going to slowly decrease and therefore they can't gamble on, on authors as readily. So that's, that's my guess. 
my answer is a little blunt. That's, that's, uh, do you think the future of publishing is in a small, small process where two to five authors team up into one house to share efforts and audiences? And I'm saying that's not my future of publishing. <laughs> And so I think that can work for some people, but I would have to say probably 75% of people fail to work together well enough to produce um, creative content. You know, I mean, there's, you, there's a lot of examples of authors who do that very successfully, but there's millions of examples of authors who don't. Um, I've seen a lot of authors team up and then fall apart and the emotional drama and angst just it it just makes it not worth it to them. And it's not worth it to me. So I think if you find authors that you want, and if you are the type of person who, who wants that sort of an opportunity, then you're going to want to find authors who have very similar um, goals as you, and you're going to want contracts. And I mean, just things just to make sure, I mean, a contract does not, it doesn't ruin a relationship it necessarily puts things on, on paper so that if anything does come up, you know how to handle it without there being a lot of drama. Um, some people are very prone to drama. I have one author friend who is constantly co-writing all, all growing, you know, forever and not just co-writing books, but like she would write a book in one series and then other authors would write books in that same series. And she just had drama just surrounding her all over all the time. And I just, I'm, I'm too much of a solo. I like, I'm an Island guys. I'm a rock. I don't, <laughs> I like, I like working on my own. I don't, I won't ever co-write except with my husband, Nolan. And even then it's still, it's, you know, it's my, my world, everything, but, um, yeah, he's the only one that I've ever considered co-writing with and it's, and that was fine, but I'm not, I, I'm not really open to co-writing or, uh, creating shared worlds and shared universes. I would say that there's enough flexibility and ways to succeed, uh, in publishing that you, if that's something that's appealing to you, you could pursue it. I, I can think of people who have, uh, started small publishing companies and they just do the thing I would say is if you're going to do that, really have a niche like sci-fi romance or fantasy romance or certain type of military sci-fi or something, whatever you enjoy. Because the whole uh, reason you would want to do that is like share mailing lists and marketing and like kind of build an audience for that house. And in order to attract readers, that everything's going to have to really be closely knit together. It's going to have to be like everybody, for them to sign up to that newsletter and want to hear about all five of those authors, they're going to have to all five, you know, be giving them the stuff they want. Um, I, I do think we have to worry about going forward. Anything that's formulaic, not to say romance, because I know we talked about that. That's not quite what I mean. But anything that's really, uh, if you can go like A, B, C happens, and then there's not really a strong author voice, I think we do need kind of AI stuff going forward that it won't be that long before sort of the basic stuff we, that there'll be software that can basically write these stories, uh, certain types of stories. So I would really focus on being, you know, developing your voice and getting readers who really are attracted to the specific thing you do that's very human and that would be hard to emulate. Like, I think if you write humor, that's going to be a long, farther down the road for, uh, before AI is going to be able to, like, I you know all the jokes. We can make the ha-has too and do the snark just as well as this urban fantasy author. Uh, not to say that humor has to be your way to stand out, but I would be thinking about, like, what can I do that's actually really niche and really me? Uh, it can be to market, but but, you know, as Joanna Penn has said on her show, double down on being human, right? Because we're not that far away, guys. I really don't think it's that far off before there's going to be just so much stuff out there. There's already a ton that ghostwriters and just people, in, authors in general, we put out so much stuff that um, there's a lot out there and there's going to be even more out there. So the hard part is going to be being really individual and, and finding a way to get an audience that highly values that and is willing to pay a premium because you'll probably see prices go down too when it's it's just that easy to click a button. And I mean, I don't know how it'll get that easy that fast, but I think we're going that way. Okay, the Francophile reader. I'd like to, uh, I always think I'd like to write a book from start to finish, but I can never come up with a plot. How do prolific authors fill the creative well to come up with so many plot lines? Um, there's a thousand different ways to answer this. You like, I don't know if I was going to use the word famously, but perhaps infamously, I stopped reading uh, creative, like I stopped reading fiction once I started writing full time because I was afraid that I would be uh, plagiarizing what I read. I don't recommend this. In fact, I recommend the opposite. If you want to be doing good contempor good fiction that matches what people are looking for, then you need to be very familiar with what people are looking for. So you should be reading the big releases uh, or at least some releases in, in your genre. 
So I think reading other people's stuff can really uh, give you uh, new ideas. I always recommend uh, writing, uh, I mean, watching bad movies. Like, watch a movie, th- and then how would I fix that? Because they didn't make that movie. The, the version that you just came up with, they didn't make that. And so that can help you get some plot lines. But also, there's like three elements of every story. There's, you know, the setting of the characters and the plot. And you can start with any one of those three when you're, when you're starting off uh, a book. You can, like, oh, I have a really cool idea for a setting. What kind of characters would be in that setting? Okay, now what would happen to those characters or you can be like I have a really cool thing I want to happen who would that happen to and where would it happen so I think you can just sort of choose anything that might interest you and just build out from there and if you're completely dry then go out and find some sort of media that someone else produced that's in the ballpark of what you were uh, interested in and just see what they did and maybe you know reverse engineer it uh, I have I've gotten myself out of a lot of corners I've written myself into by uh, watching stuff that has similar aspects and obviously I'm not going to do exactly what they did, but seeing what they did and just taking it down to its root and seeing if I can take a different direction. Just look at what other people do, and uh, I think you'll find yourself coming up with new ideas. Uh, sometimes when I'm, I'm struggling with coming up with plot, it's a lot of it is because my well is empty. Um, so like Joe was saying, read books, watch movies, and, and, and um, in my case in particular, it usually means I'm too stressed. And so I do things, I just stop stressing about um, writing and I start focusing on just relaxing and doing things that I enjoy, which again, movies and books, <laughs> and then ideas start coming. Um, I will tell you that when I read Aragon for the first time, I was like, I could do better than this. And I never, I mean, that first time I read it, it took me like six months to read it because I would start it and I'd be like, ugh. And I'd go work on my own book and then I'd continue and I'm like, ugh, and I'd go work on my own book. And, and so, I mean, Obviously, I don't think my book wasn't as good. Sorry, Andrea, you know, 12, 13 years ago, (laughs) but uh, but it did get me to get that book finished. And so a lot of it is that righteous indignation of I can do I can do better than this. And like what Joe was saying, you can you know what they they failed to do. You can do better at. Um, But honestly, once you get going, once I finished that first book, my ideas never stopped coming. And I have so many ideas still for fantasy and romance. And I mean, I have like military sci-fi and all all sorts of ideas that I probably will never write just because it would take me forever to get through them. And so once you start writing, it's getting the ideas to stop and leave you alone long enough to finish the current project that will be the problem rather than coming up with plot. Right. I agree with you guys. Reading and watching movies and things like that. I I find myself inspired both by like really good things that just I love and I totally get immersed in is like way better than I can write. And then also the things that are not that good and your mind starts wandering and you start writing your own story. I think maybe that's a hallmark, like a sign that you are destined to be a writer. If like you were a kid and you'd always start doing like fan fiction in your head, like taking some of the characters you love, bringing yourself or some other characters in and uh so that's maybe a natural thing uh and not that I, i've certainly come across successful authors who were not even big readers and didn't sit alone in their room with their stuffed animals and make up stories for them to play out so it's not like you have to have that but that's maybe the sign that like yeah you're meant to do this it, you know even if it's not necessarily a career you should be writing that maybe the creative outlet that really speaks to you um, as far as, yeah, plots, I think a number of people in the chat have re- recommended the Save the Cat book, so you could check that out. And um, whoever said, Joe and Andrea, maybe you both said this, you can kind of like take, look back, like what are your, some of your favorite books and favorite movies? And then, especially if they're not in the genre that you write in, you know, how can you like take that essentially and then put it in the genre you like to write and then come up with a character that's really you and that's not just, you know, there's, there's a, I think Austin Kleon is his name. He has a book like Steal Like an Artist or something like that. Everybody's really inspired by things they've read and, and seen. So it's perfectly fine, you know, just if you take the framework of like a story you really liked and then just how, you know, how am I going to put it in another genre or just with different characters or different time setting, you know, throw a twist on it. That's something that you're really excited about. And, but you can still kind of like, there's the outline, there's a framework for you. Uh, so it's, it's okay. Things don't have to be 100% original. And honestly, it's easier to sell things that are kind of familiar to the reader 
they they jump into it and they're like oh this is there's elements of star wars in this that's my favorite movie or, or lord of the rings and there's a reason you kind of see these same stories being told over and over again it's because we love them and we want to tell them and it's also because they sell if you write something that's super different and not like anything else good luck marketing that thing all right timothy what are the best markets to sell audiobooks through uh, so if you go exclusive with acx they they give you 40 percent earnings uh, and they just go to audible and amazon uh, so that's the easy way and they're still a big chunk of it but i've started the last couple of years going non-exclusive with acx so i only get 25 percent from uh, audible and amazon but i also upload to find away voices and they get you in like 30 other stores and a bunch of the libraries and it, so with the libraries you'll either get the library with a buy a copy of your book usually you charge more than the retail like you might charge 29.99 instead of 14.99 or you can also there's a couple where you can get paid by like if they checked it out and listened to it you get like <laughs> you know you get a dollar here or a few cents there uh, so yeah check out find away voices and ACX, do you guys have anything to add? No, I'll just add that um, um, Find Away Voices, uh, I like in particular because you have more control and that, in that you have any control at all over the cost of your your audiobooks. So uh, especially if you're planning to uh, market aggressively, you're gonna have at least some more flexibility with Find Away Voices than going on Audible exclusively. And with both of them, you can find, if you don't have a narrator already, you can audition. You tell them like, this is the book, you know, and this is what I'm looking for. And they'll kind of match you up with the narrator. And you either have to pay for it up front per finished hour, which is generally hundreds of dollars. Like it can be anywhere from like one, 150 to 400 and up, uh, depending on how experienced the narrator is and, and what they're asking for. Or you can do a royalty split, like if you're not making that much yet and you like to do it, but you do have to get somebody that like your book probably has to be selling well enough that somebody is going to go, oh, if I do the royalty split, I might actually make my money back. Like the narrator might make something for their time. Um, Sean asks, oops, where did it go? Sean asks, have you heard anything interesting about Kindle Vela while you were on vacation? I uh, I didn't follow too closely Kindle Vela. I, I looked through just enough to see if any of the stuff I've released in the past would be good to be repurposed for this. And you can't repurpose things. They want original stuff. So the answer is no on that. Uh, I've written serials before, but it was not interesting enough to me at the time for me to set aside my current project to come up with something original for it. So I haven't dug too much deeper than that. So Nolan and one of my author friends have been experimenting a lot with Kindle Vela, and this is this is what's been going on. Readers hate it. <laughs> it's very unuser friendly, which is kind of the way a lot of new things are at the beginning. You know, a lot of new programs, um, they allow the first three episodes to be free. And what a lot of authors are finding is that readers will download those first three and then hop to another author instead of downloading anything else. And so those are just things. Oh, and also. Um, Nolan says it's absolutely awful to navigate, like trying to find anything. And it's just, it's not very well designed right now, but I mean, it's Amazon and they don't generally roll things out unless they plan on making it like really, really good, you know, um, eventually sorry, I'm backing away from the camera, backing away slowly, <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah. So I think that they'll probably have a lot of work to do with it, to make it worth it. And I'm not going to deal with it until all of the kinks are out of the system. Yeah, I've only been popping a little bit into the Facebook groups this summer. So that's kind of what I've heard just in general is that so far uh, authors haven't been super impressed. It's not really been the discovery tool that people were maybe hoping. Like, I think a lot of people were like, as newer authors, especially were hoping like, oh, maybe this is a thing that can help me build an audience. It doesn't mean it won't become that. But I, I personally won't be doing anything with it. I did Kindle Worlds <laughs> back in the day. And then when that went away, only like a year later, and basically all the people who wrote stuff from my world were kind of screwed right joe like here you have a story that's in some other author's world and amazon just like oh never mind never mind and i'm like well well you guys can republish it i don't care but i'm not even sure if yeah it was i felt left out to dry and the, like the authors that participated in it were totally left out to dry so i probably won't jump on that Gabe asks, how many words or what's a good word count for a book? What's the minimum word count for a book? Uh, okay, so this is not like set in stone, but the general rules are uh, 
below 50,000 words is usually not considered a novel. You'll hear people call it a novelette or a novella below about 50,000 words. Um, the gradations, a point of argument, but I usually use uh, 50,000 words as the absolute minimum for what I would call a novel when I'm doing a novel thing. And then from there, the, uh, dis the, the length of books, uh, like the length of a good book, of an average book, changes depending on genre. If you're writing epics, your book's going to be 100,000 words, uh, you know, I would say on average, but really at minimum for a lot of uh, the, like, fantasy epic in particular. Um, but in general, if you're putting 50,000 to say 90,000, you're in the ballpark of most genres would consider to be a, a good, strong title. So right about there. My standards aren't as high as Joe's. <laughs> um, so a lot of my novels are like 45,000 to 55, some 60,000. I do have up to 90,000, but generally like 45,000. Um, again, it, it does. It definitely depends on what genre you're writing. Um, Urban fantasy is a lot sh is a lot shorter than epic fantasy. Not not a lot. Well, it is okay. So everything's shorter than epic fantasy. <laughs> but um, I would say urban fantasy, like the size of the length of the books that I've read, have been between forty five thousand and probably eighty thousand. That's pretty much typical. Um, I would say sixty thousand to seventy thousand is probably a sweet spot that you'll want to hit. Maybe seventy thousand epic fantasy, like Joe said, hundred thousand at least. Um, romance it depends on the the subgenre. There's like the novellas are super popular in some of the subgenres of romance, like Western romance the novellas. They're really great. And those are like 20,000 to 30,000, sometimes 40,000. But um, then you can, you run into the genres where you want it to be longer. And that can between be between 50,000 and 80,000. Um, um, check out Elena Johnson's Elena Johnson. Yeah. Liz Isaacson, when we interviewed her, her books are, you know, a hundred thousand words for her romances and even longer than that 120,000 words and hers are doing really well. But honestly, I think that, that, um, when we interviewed Dean Wesley Smith, Dean Wesley Smith's novels are between 40, 45 and 50,000 words. And he said that I, the most important thing is I, you do want to, you do want to cater a little bit to what readers expect. So you can't write a 20,000 word novel and epic and epic fantasy. That's not going to fly. Uh, 40,000 is not going to fly. So uh, you got to tailor a little bit to what re readers expect, but also recognize that a book is done when the whole story is told. Um, and that's going to be your goal is to make sure you tell a story. And then that's, yeah. Uh, sometimes you have to add more and don't add fluff, right? Brainstorm, add plot, all of that. That's what usually happens with me is my books usually end up being a little bit shorter than expected. And so I have to be like, okay, um, what's something I can add here that I would be able to take advantage of later on? Yep. All right. I will just add that the Sci-Fi Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Association says up to 7,500 words for a short story, 7,500 to I think 17,500 is a novelette, 17,500 to 40,000 is a novella, and anything above that is, counts as a novel. That's just that particular genre, although I think that may kind of be the trad publishing kind of rule count. Um, as far as self-publishing, you can kind of do whatever you want. Uh, like Andrea said, readers are going to have expectations. So if they're kind of used to books around 60, 80,000 words and, and you bring in 30,000 words, you know, maybe that's okay, but you probably have to charge less and expect reviews that are like, this was too short. <laughs> you know? Although I get those even with 150,000 word books sometimes. If the reader's enjoying the story, they don't want it to end. Um, if you are going to do traditional publishing, uh, then you're a little more locked in. Check out kind of the agents what they're looking for in your genre. I remember when I was looking at kind of high fantasy, epic fantasy, they actually only wanted about 80 to 100,000 words. This was like 10 years ago uh, from a newer author. Like nobody was going to do a 300,000 word Brandon Sanderson book from, <laughs> they weren't going to take it on from a newer author. Uh, you know, and even Harry Potter gets mentioned as an example of like, middle grade YA that's way longer than typical but even the first one of those was on the you know it wasn't as long they got a lot longer as the series went along and, and Deborah from accent on acupuncture I was just messing with you I know if you if you're in here with your YouTube account and you've got your keywords in there and stuff of course I, I know I, I get it if you want to comment on somebody's page you want it to lead back to your channel of course um, we'll do a few more I think we've been going for about an hour here thank you guys for all the questions Okay, Kit uh, wants to know opinions on Marlowe artificial intelligence writing analysis tool. I don't know that one. I would go check uh, the creativepen.com. Joanna Penn has a podcast and she's written a book on AI uh, for 
authors and creatives and she's really up on that stuff. I haven't heard her mention that one, but uh, it could just be, I haven't been paying enough attention. I'm actually somebody who's like horrified by that idea, even though I think it's coming, I acknowledge it. I am not ready to like just throw in my plots and my characters or throw all my books into it for, and have it come up with something. Um, I, I acknowledge that it could be a very valuable tool, but I'm a little old school. So it's going to be like kicking and screaming that I'm dragged into that. I am completely happy to do the auto ads though on Amazon and Facebook, like let the AI figure out, you know, who's going to click on my ads. Uh, but I get a little more precious about the, the creative stuff. I'm like, no way. I'm just, it's all going to be about me. Did you guys have anything to add on that? Have you heard of that one? Um, I haven't heard of it specifically, but it, uh, I, you know, I, you can't see it because of an artificial background here, but I have a, diploma on my wall because I went to NJIT and I was surrounded by computer scientists and I graduated like 20 years ago and 20 years ago they were saying that AI was going to be writing you know books and movies and they thought it was going to be five years from then and it wasn't obviously because it's 20 years later but I've been hearing about this for a while and so I've been semi-interested in watching it develop but I sort of I'm trying to keep my fingers off it because either A, I'm afraid it'll do a really good job and that'll make me nervous, or B, I'm afraid it'll do a really bad job and then I'll just be like, well, this this is a tool I thought I could use and I won't be able to use. So I just sort of keeping my distance on it, but watching interestedly. And I would say, look in the 20 Books 50K group and um, the SPF formula. What is that? What do, what do they change it to? Mark Dawson's group. Like I know it's SPF formula i can't remember it's not mastery anyway look in those groups ask in those groups because those groups have um they they're very well established they've been around for several years and uh, there's authors in there that might have uh, heard about it so yeah i think they're the self-publishing formula uh, matthew asks how did you find or how do you find an editor so I started writing 10 years ago. So the answer to that question was a website called, well, a section of a website called uh, Predators and Editors, which was not so much recommending good editors, but you know, letting you know if the editor that you're going for is uh, actually an editor. <laughs> so I went there and I found someone who was recommended well. And since then it has been a continuous string of editors recommending editors because as time has gone on, editors have gotten more busy and their slots fill up. And it turns out they tend to, to build a pretty strong network of other editors other editors they work with for overflow work. So I have three editors I work with relatively relatively frequently, and one of them I met because that person was also a, an author, and the others were just, you know, referring me back and forth between them, so they're just sort of both in my stable. I don't really know who where I would search for a new editor now besides just asking my current editors for recommendations. And I would go to specific genre groups on Facebook and ask for suggestions there. Um, because, you know, you'll start seeing patterns. So some authors will be like, yes, I, I use that same uh, uh, editor as well. So if you write in a specific genre, you're going to want an editor who's skilled with that genre and asking for suggestions, even if it's from people you don't know. And then you can always check out those authors' books to see how their look inside looks to see if you actually would think that their, um, that their, ed their editor is good. Uh, and then if multiple authors use that person, then that's good. And then like what Joe said, reach out to that editor and see if they have any availabilities. And if they don't, they can see if they can recommend somebody else. Right. And as Kit mentioned in the chat, also readsy.com is a big marketplace of editors. I think they kind of vet them. Uh, and I'm not sure if the editors have to pay to have a slot in there or not. Um, and uh, yeah, asking the author Facebook groups, you know, like, do you guys know any editors uh, that have slots open? And you know, if you have a indie authors you follow, check the forward. A lot of authors thank their editor in the, in the forward, and uh, you can reach out to them. All right. Boiler 2015. Is it worth mentioning if a cozy mystery has a romance between supporting characters in the blurb, or will romance readers balk at the pesky murder mystery getting in the way? Uh, I would, I would well, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I would say uh, if it's something that's key to your plot, um, uh, then it's worth mentioning. If you think it's just like a, a hook that will get people to read, then it's worth mentioning your blurb. If you're writing a cozy mystery, then chances are the people reading the blurb are cozy mystery readers. And so they probably won't be looking. You're probably not going to get romance readers stumbling upon your cozy mystery just because it's mentioned in the blurb. Um, so I, yeah, don't put it in there hoping to snare romance readers, but, uh, if it's, if it's a key part of the book and you think it's a sell selling point of the book, then I would definitely put it in there. 
romance adds to any plot. Um, and like Joe said, like mystery readers aren't going to be romance readers aren't going to be looking at mystery readers for books. So adding romance is not a problem. Putting it in the blurb is not a problem. Just make sure that it, the blurb is more mystery than romance and you should be good. I think I'm going to disagree with you guys. Just if I'm understanding the question right, it's about supporting characters, not the protagonists. I would leave them the heck out of the blurb. Blurbs get really confusing really quickly if you start adding anybody but the protagonist. And maybe if it's a romance, a hero and heroine and a villain, if you've got one, would be my opinion. All right. Kinetic literature. Any suggestions slash resources from people who, like Andrea, are looking to make the jump from fantasy to romance? It seems like reader expectations are much stricter, even for basic things like style slash voice. Um, well, I've not made this jump, but I will just quickly say that, uh, yeah, just you need to familiarize yourself with the structure. Uh, even if you're not going to look at resources on how to write stuff like that, read a lot of stuff like that. And romance is extremely formulaic, and specifically, it's not qualified as romance if there's not a happily ever after or a happily for now. Like, this is a defining aspect of romance, and if you didn't know that, <laughs> then that's the sort of thing you, should, you, you need to look into. If you did know that, then you're, you took a big step. And I would say, um, like, you, you know your strengths and your weaknesses. Um, what I've noticed about a lot of epic fantasy authors is they have a very, um, what's the word? Like, they're, the way they approach sentence structure is kind of more flowery, and I'm very straightforward. Um, my writing style is very contemporary because of that straightforwardness and that kind of crispness. And so if I wrote epic fantasy, which I have done before, it's not as, it does not do as well as authors who have that more, and, and Lindsay and Joe both have this style. I don't know if they noticed this, but I read both of their books and they both have a very pretty writing style. Nolan has the same writing style. Sorry, <laughs> you guys don't mind me saying pretty. Um, Lindsay's urban fantasies feel like urban fantasies though. But um, um, so when I don't, I don't have the ability to write that way. Like I'm a very blunt, very straightforward person. So that works really great for urban fantasies and it works really great for contemporary romance, but I would not excel if I wrote historical romance. And so I know that about myself and I know that, and I read, I read more romance than I read fantasy, but, um, uh, fantasy tends to frustrate me because it's really easy to screw up. Um, romance is easier to write. I'm sorry, romance authors. I do both. It's easier to write. Um, and it's harder to mess up though. When it messes up, it's usually it can be pretty big, but, um, so I read a lot of romance. And so for me, that switch wasn't, it's not been difficult because it's part of me already. So like Joe was saying, you, you want to be reading a lot of what you're going to be writing, and then you're going to want to know what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. I would say you might actually take a shot. I don't know how prolific you are, or how many, like if a book is a, a year long thing or if you write pretty quickly, but I would maybe even consider taking a shot at like doing fantasy romance first as kind of a like, let's see if I can learn the ropes of romance while still being in the familiar genre. And that could even, if you have readers for your fantasy, that could be a way to kind of like segue, transition them over if, if you, you're hoping. Because I feel like a lot of fantasy readers also like romance. I, I get a lot of crossover and they, uh, with my readers, uh, they really like the romance. I know they read a lot of contemporary romance and humorous romance in addition to like reading my urban fantasy. Um, yeah, it can be a little hard to change your style uh, to fit a genre so that I think if, like Andrea is saying, if you read a whole lot of what you want to do first, you may find that you're a little more influenced by it then and it's easier. I do have a different kind of, a little bit different of a style of voice when I switch to first person, which is what I did for my urban fantasy. I would say my third person is a little more formal and the big words want to get in there. I love my words, guys. Do not, uh, you know, all that advice. It's like, you don't use your $20 words. And I'm like, my readers love my $20 words. <laughs> it's just, it, uh, it depends a little bit on your genre. I think especially like something like sci-fi, your readers probably have more of a, more I don't know. I'm not going to say educated because you get all kinds of readers are reading romance and all these other genres too, but it's expected for there to be like techno babble and, and bigger words in, in that genre. But yeah, you, whatever you think, uh, I guess, what did you, what was the book you recommended, Andrew? You can tell it's been an hour. Words are getting hard. <laughs> Us introverts have a hard time speaking. Uh, Romancing the Beat, was it? Gwen Hayes. Yep. All right. That seems like a good one. And I actually think we might be Okay, we'll do one last question just popped up from Hawkins. How much of a how much of good writing is natural talent versus learned skill? 
Um, I think that it's all learned skill. Like we talk, natural talent is a thing that exists, but I really feel like natural talent is just how willing you are to practice. Like, so like, I, I think that uh, you can develop the ability to recognize good storytelling without ever having written anything just by, just by, uh, by reading. But when you feel, when you have a, a natural tendency to do something, you're going to do it more often. And when you do it more often, you're going to get better at it. So as great as natural talent is, I think you can go 100% on, on learned skill and, and get to the same place. You just might not get there faster because you have to work a little bit harder at the practice portion of it. And I'm going to say, like, I agree with that. Um, people who are naturally talented at things tend to be a little lazy. Um, I, I'm one of those when it comes to certain aspects. Um, not everybody, obviously there's going to be expect or, um, exceptions, but people who are naturally talented don't have to push themselves as hard. And so when they reach that comfortable spot where they're really good, they're good at it. And so they don't branch out as much. And people like me, I'm not naturally talented. Like I don't, I, I never taken a creative writing class. I had zero experience with anything creative writing. And I knew I was not talented at it, but I worked my freaking tell off, um, and I think that people who are willing to work to develop that talent are going to be more successful in the long run um, to develop, not just to develop, but actually get that talent in the first place. And then, then somebody who is naturally talented, but has a little bit of a lazy streak. That's kind of blunt. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you naturally talented people. You're awful. Um, I, yeah, I think that natural talent maybe kind of helps you. I think you're just more likely to be interested in something that you have a little bit of a propensity for, and then it becomes a passion, and then you spend all your time doing it, and it becomes kind of indistinguishable. Was that natural talent, or did that person ten, spend 10,000 hours of their life developing that skill because they loved it, because they were kind of had a flair for it when they were younger? Uh, I think that maybe voice is kind of a thing in writing that that may become naturally to some people more than others. I've read a lot of like published authors with a ton of experience that don't really have much in the way of a voice. Um, it, some authors develop a voice and they're very distinctive. Like even if they're writing under a pen name, you'd be like, gosh, I, I think I know that author. I totally, they recognize that style. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean like if you have a voice, maybe you'll attract more readers that like that, that have a similar kind of style and like that, but it's not like a recipe for success. You guys know as well as us that there are a lot of books that have really taken off and been super successful. And you're just like, huh, I wonder what it was about this book that made it take off. I'm a little puzzled. Uh, and then you read other authors that maybe you feel, yeah, a lot of it's subjective, of course, but you feel like, wow, this is super underrated. This author's like really just sucked me in and they've got a great voice and they've got a great style. And gosh, they don't have very many reviews on Amazon. They're not selling that many books. So it's nothing, I don't think success relies on you having natural talent as a writer. But like I said, I think if you have a little bit of a flair for it, you're probably gonna become more, you're gonna like it and become passionate about it and stick with it when it's hard. That's the thing where if it's, if it's just a grind from the beginning and you don't love it, it may be a lot easier to just go, eh, I'm not gonna do it this week. Uh, like the Spanish lessons I'm attempting to do right now on Babbel app, you can tell we're wrapping up. This is when I wander off. I don't know if you guys have done any of these apps to learn a language. I have this dream that once the world is normal again, I'm going to go to South America and like do one of those trips out to Easter, Easter Island. And I was like, I'm going to start learning Spanish on um, Babbel, the app. So bad, you guys. It's so very bad. Like I can listen a little bit and if, if there's a word, I can remember the word in writing, but I fail <laughs> every single time it tells me to say this phrase exactly like they said it. And it's just like, eh, try again, eh, try again. And my dogs are like, why are you cussing at the phone? It's like, okay, so no natural talent for me for learning languages. Uh, and so I might not stick with it the way somebody that had a little more flair might go on to master five languages during COVID times. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, do you guys have anything to wrap it up? We appreciate you guys coming in. I think we're going to start up probably two or three weeks or so. I don't know. We'll figure it out. The podcast. Um, I don't have nothing particular uh, uh, to add. Just, yeah, it's it's uh, it's nice to be back. and looking forward to, to getting back into this. And, and thanks for coming along live to uh, to ask questions. Wasn't 100% sure how many people would show up because people forget about stuff on the Internet pretty quickly when it's not uh, being consistent. 
How could they possibly forget us, though? <laughs> we we just... do appreciate the couple of people who tweeted and said, like, hey, we, we appreciate the show. Are you coming back? Because yeah. I, I know the last time we went on hiatus <laughs> for the science fiction and fantasy marketing podcast. Although I think we said we were ending it, didn't we? I don't remember. We but basically we'll we, we said something along the lines of like we're, we 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 warned that we might not be coming back. Uh, I know because I had to record the transition episode where I was like, "Hey, we're not coming back," but here's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everyone. Hope you all have a good rest of the summer or winter, wherever you are. <laughs> Locked down in <laughs> poor Australia right now. Yeah. See everyone later. So long, everybody. Bye bye. Okay. We are no longer.